So hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's session. My name is Hope Newport. I am the Family Services Manager at the IFOPA, and this is the first um, session of the FOP Pain Management Series. So, um, and I wanted to start by saying thank you to our 2023 IFOPA Family Services Programming Supporter, BioCris. So without the support of um, BioCrist and um, our industry partners programming like this wouldn't be possible. So we're so grateful to have them as a supporter um, and we're excited to start this series. Um, I am now going to move on to introduce our speaker for today. So Dr. Xiaobing Yu joins us. He's the Associate Professor in the Department of Anesthesia and Perioperative, Perioperative Care at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, you may Remember, Dr. Yu, if you attended the 2019 FOP Family Gathering in Orlando, he joined a panel there and spoke on pain management, um, but he's also a researcher in the FOP community. So this is a photo of him at the 2022 um, FOP Drug Development Forum, which is a meeting specifically for researchers, and he was presenting, as you can see there, about pain in, um, in patients living with FOP. So we're so fortunate to have um, Dr. Yu joining us today, and I am going to hand it over to him to start his presentation. Thanks, Hope, for the intro. I'm going to start my slides. Can you see my uh, slide? Yeah, we can okay. see it. Thank you. Thank you. So today, I think uh, it's a great opportunity uh, to talk about with the community. And one thing, hope I want to add me to, uh, you know, the, to talk about it. what is this thing called a pain? So actually, a lot of those definitions and a lot of the situations we all experience during our daily life. For example, when we're cooking, your your fingers accidentally touch the stove, and remember what you're going to do. And probably in a second, you're going to remove your finger. We often tell you have a pain, and you feel the autonomic uh, response. It's called a withdrawal response. And also playing the cold, like we are in the in a cold weather, we're playing snowball. I don't think if you're barehanded, you're not going to hold a snowball forever. The other thing is that we accidentally bump to a chair, especially when you know the most of the FOP patient may need a lot of assistance, and it can be painful. Other things are chemical irritants, and a lot of times we're talking about chili pepper. And we all know sometimes we all love spicy food, but when you prepare some spicy uh, pepper or onion, you're going to feel irritant, irritations to trigger your skin out because it's just to sensitize our neurons and we call the nociceptors, which is just the uh, neurons involved in the pain process. That's just to deal with noxious stimuli. And we often call this called a nociceptive pain. But the other thing is very common, we call it inflammation. And uh, most of the FOP patients have all been through that challenging uh, course. When we have a flare, the flare we often associated the skin become red, tender, hot, and uh, often you're going to see a swelling as well. We call it this is called inflammation and always, always associate pain. And during that process, a lot of immune cells, including macrophage, master cells, and neutrophil granulocytes can. Uh, recruited to the injury site, release a lot of the tons of the cytokines, which causing those phenotypic changes, the color changes, the temperature changes, and the pain as well. And often associated with tissue damage, we call it, the, the one thing we notice is that those pain just always there. And even you don't trigger, don't provoke it, the pain remain unchanged. And also if you touch that area, it's quite a sensitive, quite a painful, even gentle touch, so that's the reason is that when we have that inflammation, usually you want to be, you know, caregiver or yourself want to be cautiously touch that area because it triggered the hypersensitivity type of pain. So we call it inflammatory pain. Other condition is also, we, you heard a lot of them. And uh, if you uh, participate in my previous talk, we talked about a neuropathic pain. What does that mean? It's often associated with nervous system damage. And, uh, when we have a nerve damage associated with that can contribute a different type of pain, we call it neuropathic. 
And some patients is that, uh, uh, as Hope highlighted in the uh, earliest uh, uh, er minutes ago, and she mentioned the pain and uh, you know the stress, mental health, always hand in hand. And a lot of times we have this kind of dysfunction, debilitating pain. However, we just are not able to find the nerve damage. We cannot find any inflammation. There is just no physical cause, but pain is really a truly present. So it's more like emotional component uh, uh, which contribute to this pain. And often the pain feature is that they're also spontaneous and you touch the certain area and is a very sensitive to touch and uh, you don't need to push hard. It's just even gentle touch, patient will jump. This is a called pathological uh, neuropathic type pain. The one thing is that we, over the years, we say, what is the mechanism behind this? Actually, back to 1644, uh, I'm sorry. And there is a, a Italian painter draw this picture. Actually, most of our research love this because it is accurately delineate the pain pathway. You have a fire and uh, you know, the fire causing the skin pain, burning pain, the pain sent from the peripheral nerve all the way to the spinal cord, you can see from here, and then sent to the brain stem and into the brain. So we often say, where do we feel the pain eventually? It's in our brain. And that's the reason you start to see is that when you, uh, you know, your finger accidentally touch the stove, uh, it takes some time for you to remove the finger. It's because that is noxious signal sending back to the cord to the brain, allow the brain to send you the signal say, I have to remove my finger because it's dangerous. Evolutionary, pain is actually a defense system for human being and for any animals to survive better because that's the body to detect the, the dangerous environment. So here is that the, from the anatomical point of view, you have a peripheral nerve and it collected all those noxious stimulations and signals into we call a dorsal ganglion and in which many of those sensory neurons accumulated, then they keep sending those fibers into the spinal cord. This area we call the dorsal horn neurons. And they are the major location to process the pain in our spinal cord. And further on, they send the signal to the brain stem, eventually to the brain. So the one question is, how do we know brain react? How do we know the brain activity and truly reflect the painful stimulation. So one thing is over the years, people have noticed we can use a functional MRI and using those uh, metabolic markers, label them and use MRI technology. And at a real time, we can record the brain response when the volunteers touch the heart, uh, uh, you know, the block, or you stimulate them with the uh, mechanical force. So here, Use the micro MRI and it stay in these big tubes and the brain can be recorded at a real time. And we often can separate the pain from emotion. And I want to show you some of the kind of a processed and MRI uh, report. You can see this brain regions and it's a very busy brain regions. But if you look carefully, you can see is that pain, which is yellow and emotion is red. But often you see the very nice overlapping which is support our earlier, uh, you know, the conclusion, pain and emotion often hand in hand. So often when we treat the pain, we often have to treat both physical component and emotional component. And recently uh, our UCSF surgical team and they uh, published the data, they able to put the deep uh, brain stimulator using the uh, inside of the brain and directly record the brain activity. This is a card, you know, this is a, able to tell us when in this uh, stroke pain patient, how do they respond in the brain area in particular? So this is another advance. So let's back to everyone who recognized this is our ossification uh, occurred. This is in the, in the mice. We develop, we recapitulate ossification and we introduce a mutation. So actually heterotopic ossification is not uncommon. And as we all know, this bone formation appear in the non-ossified regions, such as muscle connect tissues upon the stimuli. And uh, it's very commonly in the battlefield. When you have a blast surgery, you also have an orthopedic surgery when the hip replacement or the hip replacement, 
surgical uh, stimuli can trigger the ossified uh, bone formation around the neck tissues. Another common um, you know, myth we often encounter is a spinal cord injury patient. Often over the time, they can develop an ossification peripherally. And uh, the mechanism remains unclear. But one thing we all know is that debilitating pain, pain, a hallmark injury and a neuropsy is a clinical challenge when we're treating the heterotopic, variety of heterotopic ossification in this population. Disappointingly, the little progress has been made in developing effective treatments for either HO, heterotopic ossification, or its associated pain. FOP is a very unique hereditary heterotopic ossification, provide us a great opportunity to understand the mechanistic insights when we try to see is not only treated FOP condition and the potential can help us broad our spec, you know, target and uh, um, you know, spectrum to help other HO, the uh, general HO patients. And uh, using the IFLPA database, we previously people find out the chronic pain actually reported by 86% of the patients in one cohort. Many of them were not experiencing any active flare. So that means without a flare up, they, a lot of people still constantly, persistently experiencing pain. And about one third of patients report sensitivity to touch to temperature sensation at a baseline, suggesting the ACVR1 mutation because majority of those patients carry the classic mutation is a point mutation, a gain of function point mutation, which is R206H, you are aware, may alter the somatosensory function. With the help of our patient and the family members, and uh, some of you in this audience, and probably already remember you participated in my um, uh, study in the past, we're able to recruit the patients. We test, directly test the pain threshold upon the cold stimulation, upon the heat stimulation and the mechanical stimulation, and to determine the threshold of the pain compared to their family members. We also utilize the patient donated fibroblast, like a you know, skin biopsy. We're able to develop, differentiate in a petri dish into the sensory neurons, which is important to sense the pain signal and all the uh, noxious stimuli. We find that one thing is that at a baseline, without the uh, you know, pain flare, without the HO flare, pain patient, FOP patient had a mechanical and a heat pain hypersensitivity. And compared to their family members, although the, the, the major genetic background is the same, however, they are more sensitive to hold a couple of hot coffee from Starbucks or when you touch any kind of a stimulation, they are more sensitive. And the pain threshold means lower compared to their family members. And also using those, uh, you know, the iPSC pluripotent stem cell derived sensory neuron study, we find this mutation, R2XH mutation is not only sufficient, it's also necessary for the new differentiated neuron to fire faster compared to the Y-type control which is a hallmark of neuropathic pain. So we change the gear a little bit. This is a famous painting um, record the probably most important moment in the modern surgery and anesthesia. So it happened in the Mass General at Boston. We call this called an ether day. So that is a day, this is a demonstration, public demonstration at a Boston Mass General Hospital so you can see one gentleman, this is Mr. Martin, who, who is a dentist, actually, he using this a container to deliver ether, to put a patient un, uh, unconsciousness. The, the chief of the surgery of the department who cut the neck to remove a tumor, that day is marking the beginning of the modern anesthesia and the surgery because the surgery, is always associated with a pain management, which allow the surgeon to do more invasive, more broad and uh, long lasting uh, complicated surgeries, uh, procedures. So pain management is essential associated with our career. However, everyone know the surgery and injections may lead to catastrophic flare ups in our population, which have the FOP. So, that's a part of the reason today we are talking about, if we manage the pain, we're gonna focus on the pharmacological management. 
And we often highlight the importance to do the multimodal management. And you can see here, I, I provide a lot of those potential pharmacological options. The first I'm gonna uh, discuss about anti-inflammation. And many patients here, you probably remember doing a flare, you contact us, for example, my colleague, Dr. Shaw, probably send you a you know, long list of emails. One thing he always give you is a corticosteroid. He will provide your, your providers and talk to you over the phone. And he give you the corticosteroid, uh, you know, the, um, the regimen and also involved the tapering. And other things that if the, the things are uh, improving and most of you guys, I think some of the patients even today still on the Celebrex, one is a COX-2 inhibitor and for long-term. The common question I received is that, is, is it safe to continue on the COX-2 inhibitor? So the other things ibuprofen, you are aware, ibuprofen and apoxone are non-selective. So what does the major difference? So the, the study from the FOP literature did show there is a mild or um, evidence to support select the COX-2 inhibitors such as um, Celebrex or the oral topical non-select NSAIDs may have a role in the symptomatic management of flare-ups and the chronic apoplexy when corticosteroids are not indicated. And uh, in the preclinical study, people did show is that in animal models, NSAIDs might be able to reduce inflammatory prostate glanding levels and potentially increase the threshold for heterotopic ossification development. So the hypothesis is that on the persistent NSAIDs, uh, you know, the uh, regimen, it might be make the heterotopic bone form difficult and in, with a hope to reduce the flare up. As we all know, more than 100 million prescription every year issued in the United States alone. So we needed to know what are the major side effects we should uh, consider. For example, kidney damage. We often tell when we're getting older, aging can cause a lot of the liver uh, functionality changes. So we often ask a patient, if an elderly patient, especially our grandparents, we have to ask them cautious to take NSAIDs, which may impact the further dam uh, worsen the kidney function. If someone has end stage renal disease, you, you basically NSAIDs is no longer recommended. A, a rare genetic condition, we have a patient is a congenital, just one has one kidney. In those patients, I often don't recommend them take NSAIDs because we're concerned about, we want to preserve that single precious kidney. Or especially someone with kidney uh, you know, transplant, the same thing, we want to avoid the NSAIDs completely because given the concern of the kidney damage. The other thing is that we know NSAIDs can impact the platelet function. So that's the reason is that some of you, if you have a schedule for surgery and you may receive a pre-op phone call from your provider, they said you should stop NSAIDs for seven days. That is the reason because we want to reduce the bleeding uh, risk. One major problem for people just, you know, cannot take NSAIDs is because it messes in my, uh, you know, the stomach. And uh, sometimes I even have uh, GI bleeding. That's the reason is that a COX-2 inhibitor may have a, a role here. And a COX-2 inhibitor is known to have less GI side effect. Cardiovascular risk. And uh, even today, some of my elderly patients still tell me the old uh, Vioxx, which is a very specific COX-2 inhibitor, um, now is because of the risk of heart attacks has been pulled out of the market. They still remember Vioxx was the best NSAID they ever tried for pain management. So giving that a concern, how about the current very, we only have a Celebrex is probably the main remained um, COX-2 inhibitor in the, in the market of the US. So is this safe? There was a study published a couple of years ago and what their purpose is that they wanna compare COX-2 inhibitor, which is a Celebrex with the other non-select NSAIDs such as uh, ibuprofen, naproxen, they found actually when they look at the cardiovascular risk, they're equivalent. So COX-2 inhibitor, particular Celebrex, which is still available in the market, and some of the, uh, our patients on daily, uh, twice a day uh, doses, it is remains compared to the other ibuprofen, naproxen we often know is that it's, it's, the, the cardio risk is equivalent. 
However, when they look at the GI side effect, Celebrex lead to significantly lower side, of com side effect or the of GI complements when they compare with the other uh, non-selective one. So in general, we tell the provider, mainly the primary care provider, and uh, Celebrex is safe from the cardiovascular safety perspective. Okay. So the other thing is that people always say, given all the concerns, what about a topical? Indeed, the topical NSAIDs can have limited, or the, it's not a completely no systemic absorption, it still has. That's the reason is if it's a topical, you want to avoid the, um, the breakdown skin because it will increase the systemic absorption, but risk will be significantly reduced. So some of the available um, you know, prescribed or uh, over-the-counter topical agents, such as Voterian gel or Voterian patch, which is prescribed, uh, Cataprofen cream and patch, but unfortunately is not available in the US. Some of the international patients may know this, they're available in your country. So the early study did show is that some of those topical agents might be better uh, in certain conditions, especially for acute soft tissue injury. And there is some study did show is that topical agents is, um, is safe and effective when they compare placebo. However, notably, I want to point out because some patients have very sensitive skin. They may have the irritation from the skin cause uh, contact dermatitis, itching, and especially now in the summertime, we have a lot of areas, particularly in the States, where you know, the fighting with heat wave and the sweating may not keep the topical agent stable there. So they may affect the, uh, the drug effect. And interesting, some of the case report from Japan, they do notice is that in elderly patients, sometimes they overuse. It could be associated with a co uh, cognitive uh, function changes or a misunderstanding, the overuse topical agent can still contribute to the lower GI bleeding. So keep that in mind. Other condition we're talking about a topical the lidocaine cream, you can get the prescription one is 4% or 5%. And also the over-the-counter is about 4%. Same thing is that uh, they may have the skin irritation. Another one is the capsaicin. It's a targeting the triple U1 fibers. However, most of the patients complain about the burning sensation. So in reality, we often ask a patient to try to put the skin uh, with the lidocaine cream first for five to 10 minutes. Then you can apply capsaicin cream or gel. So recently, I think that in Europe the, uh, and in the Brazil, the other countries, usually the high percentage capsaicin patch has been proved. Recently, it has been proved in the United States as well. However, we have to usually apply the lidocaine first to reduce the burning sensation. Other things we probably, some of you use during the sports injury, we use a salon pass. It's mainly uh, uh, to dilate the blood vessel, so provide the soothing worms feelings. Other things I'm gonna focus on the next is about neuropathic agents. I think when we uh, did the study, we talked a lot of patients, actually quite a few patients already tried neuropathic such as gabapentinoids, TCA, and SNI, and TCA tricyclic is a very old uh, antidepressants. And we realize is that lower dose can be used to treat neuropathic pain as well. And another serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors also have been used to treat a lot of neuropathic conditions. Notably, it is a first line treatment for neuropathic pain, if you remember my first slide. So gabapentinoids is probably the most prescribed in neuropathic, uh, you know, in the world because of safety profile. The major one, the gabapentin, another name called neurontin, pregabalin is another one. And uh, it is a calcium channel blockers. TCA, some of you probably remember, is amitriptyline, nortrimine, it's been in the market for a long time. SNI, the duloxetine, and the venophylaxins, all right? So often is that the side effect the gabapentin and pregabalin is probably better tolerated. However, it is metabolized through the kidney. So if someone has end-stage renal dysfunction, you have to be carefully adjust the dose, cut down the dose significantly. We often tell the, the provider locally that someone has end-stage renal disease, the maximum daily dose of gabapentin is only about 100 milligrams. It does cause a sedation and a help um, and a GI upset. As it is a calcium channel blocker, some of you, you take um, 
calcium channel blocker to control your blood pressure, you may notice your doctor, cardiologist may tell you, because of those calcium channel blocker, you may notice the ankle swollen. It's the same thing for uh, you occasionally you may observe when you're taking gabapentin and pregabalin. And interestingly is that in our chronic pain population, we often notice the um, insomnia, the difficulty to sleep is a major issue. And we realize is that if we can improve the sleep, we can help patients sleep better. Recently in the preclinical model, and we able to recapitulate that phenomenon we observed in the patients. For example, in mice, if you sleep deprive the mice for 24 hours, mice will develop the sensitivity to touch, to temperature, hallmark in neuropathic pain. Importantly, if you restore the sleep cycle, all the symptoms went away. So in practice, we often take advantage of the sedative side effect of the gabapentinoids or tricyclics. Ask a patient at take in a night. Often take advantage of sedative side effect to help patient sleep better. So this is something just to keep in mind. They often notice we use that for the, not only for pain, also trying to improve the sleep. Tricyclics is well known to cause dry mouth weight gain. And uh, uh, when people are getting older, I usually, uh, you know, if people are older than 75, my personal preference, I don't recommend because when the people suddenly stand up, the pressure may drop. If they fall, that's a big risk. And also we ask a patient, do you have a you know, history of arrhythmia, which is irregular herpes? If that is the case, we do not recommend tricyclics. And duloxetine uh, for a shorter period of time, especially during the initial trial stage, patient may report increased nausea, but will go away afterwards. And for long-term chronic use, we ask a patient, especially someone who has a pre-existing liver dysfunction, you have to be very cautious because it may worsen the liver dysfunction. The other thing is opioids. Someone always asks, what is the best pain medication available? I always tell them opioids. It is most effective, fast onset, but unfortunately, the problem is a long-term effect. So some of you probably used, especially during the flare, we have used a short acting such as Norco, Lortab, Vicodin, and Percocet, oxycodone, and uh, uh, some of the um, morphine doses, Roxno, if someone has difficulty to swallow, long acting, oxycontin, MS content, KDN, and a fentanyl patch. All those things are available. In general, is that the, nowadays, I usually don't recommend the long term or the long acting uh, opioids. Uh, in the past, there was some hypothesis, that, uh, you know, also the, supported by the pharmaceutical company, they want to use more long-acting. The hypothesis is that it may reduce the tolerance, reduce the addiction. Decades later, we realized that's not true. So if you have to use the opioids, I still think it is used. The only thing is that you cannot use forever in order to reduce the long-term side effect. So it's very effective, but we always need to consider the potential harms. And in this case, you can, I listed here is a lot of the, uh, you know, the common side effects associated with the uh, opioid therapy. The most important is respiratory depression. That's why, you know, we, you, especially in the United States, we have heard of the opioid um, epidemic is because associated with, unfortunately, the, the life loss because of the respiratory depression. All right. I think a lot of the patients, um, you know, reached the hope and me and wanted me to talk about marijuana. And thanks, Hope, for providing this global uh, map. And um, you can see that increasingly, uh, marijuana has been approved legally used um, in for the medical uh, purpose. But you still see the large area, this dark area, including Asian, Russia, all the things. You probably remember recently where the basketball uh, star was, you know, was detained in, in Russia for a long time because using the marijuana uh, age, uh, re, uh, product. So it is still the challenging things, especially in some of the country they travel overseas and you still need to you know, pay attention to local policy. In the United States, we still have, if you see those, um, the orange shaped, there's still the states, few states, increasingly less and less states, still um, you know, uh, has not been fully legalized for marijuana use, but increasingly, across the uh, state border, 
and the marijuana for uh, you know recreational or medical use often uh, is uh, is legal. So I want to talk about what the marijuana reagent, especially for FDA approved reagent, available for our patient. So. In, in addition, you get from the marijuana shop and we're in the San Francisco. So if you travel to San Francisco in the future, you may find a lot of those shops available. And uh, my, many patients, my patients actually use that. They have a drip, they have a the powder, they have, um, you know, the uh, pills, they have a cream, they have all kinds of sometimes it's like, you know, mind blowing knowledge. The medical marijuana, the cannabinoids already approved and by FDA. They're mainly the, the two components, we call it THC and CBD. And uh, there are several of them improved uh, by FDA in the United States and in Europe. For example, jonabino and nabilone, the synthetic form of the THC, and mainly used approved for cancer patients. And uh, nambexamols contain the standard extract THC and is also the non-psychoactive CBD as well. So, People have done a lot of study in the past. So they want to say that if we use the FDA approved or the legally approved uh, uh, product of the cannabinoids, can we treat, for example, pain condition? They chose the one of the, the challenging condition, which is neuropathic pain, I mentioned earlier. So historically, actually um, in uh, India, you know, 27, uh, you know, 2700 BC before, the cannabinoids already used to treat uh, well-being, to treat diseases. Over the years, people started find out they're able to find the extract, to find the THC, the CBD, and the scient nowadays scientific uh, evidence to show is that actually it has a lot of physiological functions. For example, they can target the trip one channel, and target a lot of things. The question is that, where are those uh, receptors? Actually, you'll be surprised. The receptor to bind the cannabinoid is everywhere from our peripheral nervous system in our skins, the dorsal root ganglion that you probably remember from early slide, spinal cord is a pain processing center and the brain is everywhere. And it has a variety of the functions. And the people I'm trying to do is that like depression, the pain, but today I'm just focused on the pain. So in preclinical models, mainly in the animal rodent animal models, using those, um, they look at uh, the potential anti nociceptive efficacy of cannabinoids, they did a show is that if you treated a mice with cannabinoids and they find out that actually those medicate, this cannabinoids can reduce the injury or inflammation associated sensitivity and the pain in this animal models. However, what happened to the clinical settings? There is quite a few of the study, random trials, controlled trials, and they wanted, the first thing they want to say, is the safe used in the patient population? And the second question, is this effective? So there are quite a few of the studies and looking at it, I want to show uh, some of the evidence. For example, in this meta-analysis, they showed not stronger evidence to support, but at the same time is that not also not strong enough to refute the efficacy or the safety of the use. Another study they did show is that the the, they look at all the studies, published uh, studies, and focus on neuropathic pain. And they also find there is not significant evidence to show is that the cannabinoid is harmful, but it also they, they cannot have enough evidence to support the benefit. But interesting, they did show is that if they look at the patient population who try the cannabinoids in the study, they all report they feel better. They're able to sleep better, as I mentioned earlier. So how do we access the medical um, cannabis? And uh, um, some of you probably know in the federal level, so the cannabis use is still some controversial. So when we work in the large academic institution, usually I personally, I don't prescribe marijuana. And, but there is um, in the community, there are quite a few position, uh, physicians, they got the license who, is, uh, who are willing to prescribe. So you've asked around, if the marijuana products is legalized in your state, you might be able to go to the shops and uh, to purchase. But talk to your family doctor who have more knowledge, know your neighborhood, know your community, so they can give you very good uh, advice. 
So one thing is I always wonder is that people ask it, if I have to go to the surgeon for the family members as well, if I'm having to use the marijuana, do I need to uh, prepare anything? Do I need anything I should know? It does have some, this is a new guideline published for anesthesiologists and for surgery guidance. There is some things that we can say is that, so if someone using the marijuana, the cannabis heavily, it might impact the uh, post-surgical recovery. So bring this up to your doctor when they have a pre-op evaluation, usually for the major surgery, and that you're gonna meet an anesthesiologist or the surgical team provider to talk about a condition. Bring this up to them because they may have some concerns. All right, so I took this photo uh, from Vancouver and I was amazed by this um, observation. I think it's just remind me of the challenging we're facing the translational study. Especially we, have, we do a lot of the basic research, we do a lot of the preclinical research, but how do we translate it into patient care? It is always a challenge. And uh, we often realize a lot of time we got a good uh, you know, results from the basic research, but then when we're applying to human being, it is just a failure. So in order to do that, and we find a lot of ways is that we look at our patient population and we want to address the patient need. So the current research, I think in, uh, some of you probably heard of my talk before is that we're trying to come out of the question from our patient population and using the human genes, using human uh, tissues like uh, the iPSC cells and then translate into the preclinical model. We want to avoid a potential gap we're facing in the clinical studies. So again, thanks for the help and support. I know, I, you know um, I have learned a lot from, uh, from you and your family members, and this is a very supportive and uh, uh, community. I really enjoy working with you guys. All right, hope you can take okay. over. I was gonna say, I think the feeling's mutual, Dr. Yu. So <laughs> thank, I wanted to start by just um, saying thank you again for taking the time out of your day to come present to our families, because I know that you have done this for researchers, but being willing to do this again to the community and different lens um, is really valuable. So thank you for that. And we do have a couple of questions that I wanted to ask. So the first one is, um, someone asked, I have recently seen studies about the use of marijuana having negative long-term effects on the brain. Is this something that you've heard about or are there any concerns there? Yeah, I think it's a good thought. And uh, the question is that is, uh, you know, have we settled this, uh, those um, discussions? Probably not. So I always are cautious, for example, for a lot of the medical studies, you can find any publication available if you want to just to choose uh, one conclusion. For example, during the pandemic, you all learned you can hear all kinds of different conclusions regarding the efficacy of the vaccine or call hurricane and the other things. So one thing I always suggest is that look for the quality of the, uh, the study because we can easily conclude based on the study. But a lot of times it, it's a design of the study or the limitation of the study. So I think keep our mind open. I think for us as a researcher, we're open for any suggestion, any study, but always cautious to conclude. So the, the study I put out is basically the, the, we, the meta-analysis, they're trying to do their best because some of the study is just poorly designed, is low quality, so may not impact the function. But they're using the meta-analysis, they screen out the filter through and are trying to retain the better design of the study. And so far in the pain study, the conclusion is that it doesn't look like it's harmful, but it also finds the little evidence to support the benefit. So that is, I think, our consensus. But regarding whether it's going to have a long-term impact on the brain, I think we have to wait and see. But it's definitely, I think, it's, it's, it's important to keep this in mind. And uh, we often say is that smoking might be not ideal because any smoking form will impact your lung physiology. So uh, I have a lot of patients on the, on the marijuana, but I often tell you uh, that my personal opinion, I just feel long-term smoking. Even the marijuana potentially is, um, is not harmful to your organs, but smoking format itself can injure, can damage your lung long-term. 
Right. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it was interesting seeing, you know, the side effects for some of the more um, traditional pain medications that you covered, but when it comes to, um, to the medical marijuana, there's just not the research there for it yet. So, um, we had another question. Someone was wanting to know more about your study and about what you found um, in the relationship between the FOP gene and pain hypersensitivity. So um, they had never heard of that before, and they were wanting to know, you know, where this information came from and if there's any plans to explore how that affects pain management. Thank you. I think you, 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 you I think that was my favorite topic. <laughs> I thought it was too exclusive. So we started this actually, uh, Doc Shell. I will tell you the story. So we have one patient and his family, and uh, who inspired me to participate in this community. Um, hope you probably know them. And unfortunately, she passed away uh, several years ago. So I was in our pain service as an in, inpatient service, and Dr. Shell called me to say, "Hey, we have this patient as a challenging pain condition. Can you help out?" That was the first time I was involved. When I was introduced to FOP, I had no clue. Honestly, I had to go home and find that what FOP stands for and start to learn. That was the first time I heard about it. And over the years, I became this patient's a personal, like a PCP or family doctor. And it was a long journey. And over the time, we feel that management is extremely challenging. And we started looking into it, and also we, uh, I started, you know, the, uh, participating in the uh, family gathering. And we increasingly find out uh, the sensitivity, as I mentioned in my early slides, and uh, um, and the pain is very common, even in the absence of the flare. So that was the kind of an inspiration for us to study. We said, well, we know there's uh, FOP is well known as a musculoskeletal condition, the bone disease. And unlikely is a social nervous system, but the symptoms, the, the, the complaints from the patient suggest there might be a nervous system damage. That's why we started. We recruited the patients and, and the family members and starting, I think it was uh, 2017 or 2016, when we first together uh, in the, uh, we, um, I think uh, Dr. Shaw was running the clinical trial. Then I think we have a gathering in San Francisco. That was the first time we recruited the patient and family that, the whole community was very supportive. So we started to test the threshold. We find actually compared to the genetic equivalent of family members, and uh, most of those FOP patients carry the, uh, the R2X uh, classic uh, mutation. They are more sensitive to heat, to mechanical stimulation, but they are okay with cold. Actually, one of our study patients in, uh, in this area also told me the same thing. They said, you know, the cold weather, I'm okay, but the hot weather, I just couldn't bear. So then we're looking at just to see what is the mechanism involved. That's why we study the, you know, the, using the human-derived uh, sensory neurons we're looking. And interestingly is that when we introduce this point mutation to my animals, so one thing is always confounding factor in the patient when you look at the pain is that because they already have FOP, they have, the, you know, the um, malformation. So sometimes the systemic impact may contribute to the pain condition because remember, pain is part of the bigger picture. But interesting, when we introduce this single point mutation into animals, only let them express the sensory neurons, we are able to recapitulate both mechanical and heat pain sensitivity. So what does it tell us? It means this mutation is enough without those FOP with bone conditions. And it may also trigger the uh, sensitivity of nerve system. So we are currently working on targeting this, um, you know, the uh, R2XH pathway because we believe it's a link between pain and also DHO. So by doing targeting this way, hopefully we are not only able to reduce the pain uh, you know, from the physiological point of view, we might be able to reduce the injury of the heterotopic ossification. The one thing our clinical findings, uh, you know, basic research findings that using animal model, if we look at the ossified bone, we find that there is a enriched or sprawling extensive nerve innervation, which doesn't occur before the injury. So currently we're waiting for the NIH grant and uh, uh, we, uh, most likely we're gonna get funded and to support our initiative. Hopefully very soon I can tell you more 
what we're finding. So our, our goal here, we aim at targeting not only the pain, we wanna see whether we can help HO as well. 